We are on Parsh with weekly Torah portion, Parsh by Midbar, page 727, 726, excuse me. And uh, it says in the introduction, if you look at the introduction, it says the book of Bamidbar deals in great measure with the laws and history of the tabernacle during Israel's years in the wilderness. Rambam, Ramban notes, how are you? Just grab a chumash. It's three, 726. Ramban notes striking parallels between the tabernacle as seen through the light of these laws and the revelation at Sinai. These comparisons suggest that the tabernacle and later the temple and the synagogue was to serve as a permanent substitute for the heavenly presence that rested upon Israel at Sinai. By making the tabernacle central to the uh, nation, not only geographically but conceptually, the people would keep, quote unquote, Mount Sinai among themselves always, just as they had surrounded the mountain longing for closeness to Hashem, they would encamp around the tabernacle symbolizing the, that their very existence was predicated on their closeness to the Torah. Accordingly, this book contains the commandments to safeguard the tabernacle for the tribes to be arrayed around it and for the, uh, the conduct of the Kohanim and the, Le the Levites when it was dismantled and transported. All of this enhances the glory and prestige of the sanctuary as illustrated by the parable of the sages, a royal palace that is not safeguarded is unlike one that is safeguarded. So here we're going into starting the book of Bamidbar, which literally means in the wilderness. And we're going to talk about the, the uh, creation, if you will, of the Jewish people. In other words, we're going to have the numbers. We're going to ha we'll find out how many people are there, namely 603,550 men from the age of 2060. And we're also going to see how they're separated from by, by tribes. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to be separated more wow. into uh, encampments around their tabernacle. It's going to be a square, basically, on the tabernacle with the tabernacle being in the middle because that is the center of our, should be, the center of our lives. And if you think about it, originally when we create when we create communities, even to this very day, mm -hmm. we buy uh, houses around the shul oh, yeah, yeah. so that the yeah. shul becomes the central point yeah. again. When it ceases to become a central point, as we see when we move into we, when we move into suburbia, uh, all of the um, conservative and reform movements when we no longer have to live in the area, but now we can drive to Shul. So that distances you from the Torah, and which is represented by the synagogue, and it makes you go further and further away. So there, the biggest problem that the conservative and reform did was give permission to drive. If they would have given permission to drive, then people would have felt a little guilty and may have stayed in the area. I'm not sure they would have. I mean, that's just mm -hmm. <laughs> something we can't really figure out. Yeah, and then that, that, I think that speaks to the reason why reform and conservative, it, uh, it, for the most part, especially reform, don't have a daily minute. It's just almost no such thing. Well, they don't have a daily minute for that. different reasons. Yeah. They, ah. But that, yeah. I think it's a mistake, by the way. I'll say this for the first three, set, three minutes of the tape. I think that if the, uh, if the conservative reform would wake up and realize that the minion is probably the greatest tool for recruitment in any synagogue setting, mm -hmm. and they would rush to make those minyanim, mm -hmm. even if they're counting women. I don't really care what they count. Yeah. The point is to get a group, not to, be, not to let it go below 10, but uh, to have 10 and continually increase because when you have this, when you have a, uh, a minion, a daily minion, what happens is people have a connection. It's a cohesion. Right, so there's cohesion, there's a connection to the building, yeah. there's a connection to the rabbis, a connection to the community. Yeah. There's a real feeling of connection. When you cease that, when you stop that, mm -hmm. and, or you allow it to die because you don't want, you don't want to wake up in the morning. Away, right, right. so now what happens is you now have to have a lot of fundraisers mm -hmm. and people are now figure, asking, well, why am I spending yeah. Thousand dollars, by the way, for reform center, like three thousand yeah, dollars yeah. for three days a year. That's a thousand dollars a day. <laughs> I don't know if I want that. I can get, I can go to a Broadway show much cheaper than three thousand dollars. <laughs> okay, and I can, or I can go to the beach, 
and get much more in touch with God. I mean, I was walking from my house to here, and I don't know if anybody's knows, but there's leaves on the trees. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's green. Yeah. yeah. A, a couple of weeks ago, what? There's flowers on the trees. Too. Flowers. A couple wow. of weeks ago, everything was dead. Uh, it was barren, and now, Baruch Hashem, everything is bursting with life. It's springtime. It's unbelievable. Uh, just what a couple of weeks will do. And again, that's my closeness with Hashem. Uh, so some people say, I don't have to go to synagogue. I can look at the trees. I can appreciate nature, blah, 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 blah. And they're right, by the way. I'm not going to argue with them. They're right. Do, 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 go into the woods, do a body, do talk to God yourself, and you, you've done something. But you've missed the opportunity of a minion. You've missed the opportunity of community. And with all that, that's what I'm saying. They lost that when they allowed people to flitter away and didn't and because they're 20 miles away from the shoal or five miles away from the shoal or wherever they are, it no longer becomes the center of their life. And it, as a result, Torah is no longer a center of their life. So and that's what, the, what Hashem was creating here with the encampments that we'll be learning about in this, in this parsha. The question is why we have to encamp around the Torah? Why not just buy real estate when I want? Why do I have to be with it this small area? And the answer is because the Torah is the center of our life. Without the Torah, what are we? We're just nobody, right? The Torah is what makes us Jews. It's not that we make the Torah. The Torah makes us. So if that's the case, that's our connection to Hashem. So we have to have that. So that's another thing that we're learning very much in this Parsha. The other thing we're learning in this Parsha, by the way, I'm going way ahead, but I probably won't get covered so much. But if you think about it, we went from 70 people. We counted when we went to Egypt. We came with 70, exactly 70 people. Okay. In 210 years, we went from a population of 70 to a population of over 3 million, of more. We, we lost a, uh, t was it, 80% uh, of the people went to Midrash. But even without that Midrash, even without that Midrash, yeah. you went from 70 to, in 210 years to 603,550 men wow. between the ages of 20 to 60, which means you had approximately two to three million people there. That is an amazing population growth. Mm. Mm. And that is again showing the kindness that Hashem had, even though they were in uh, subjugation, mm. we were still having a wonderful population. We were, uh, okay, we, we maintained something of our Jewishness, maybe our names, our clothes, so, uh, our language, and I'm missing one. But uh, there's four things we kept. But uh, the, the point, and probably a religion, but it's, I forget what it was. Uh, this circumcision? For, what? We didn't do circumcision. Oh, right, that's what you did. That we didn't do. Uh, but we had clothes, we, again, it's the clothes, the language, Name. the, um, what is it, what's the third thing I said? Names. Names, and I forget the third thing. The, the fourth thing, I forget what it is. But we, we kept four things. That was clear. And of course, because we were living in Goshen, we also kept distant from them. That was that's what uh, that was put into the plan by Yosef, keep you guys away, huh. and then you won't assimilate as much. And still, all we still assimilate plenty. Okay, we were still a part of the uh, very much part of the community. But with all that, like I'm saying, there's a lot of uh, think about what how we are expanding, um, growing today. If you look at the except for take the Orthodox community out of the picture, we have a negative growth. We're negative. We have 1.3 kids or something. So it's a neg. I mean, the whole United States is negative, but certainly the Jews are negative growth, and which is why, by the way, their movements are dying no. because there's nobody to replace them. Literally. Right? Literally. Literally. They're dying literally because there's nobody to replace them. And that's unlike the Orthodox that are having at least three, many times five, many times seven. Yeah. Not, not many times, but 14. Mm -hmm. And so you're having a lot of kids and you're educating them. You bring them to day school. You're, the amount of money that we are spending on education is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Okay? I don't care if you're homeschooled or not. The amount of, in order to homeschool, you have to spend money on those books. <laughs> the amount of money and time that we put into education to make sure our kids are going to remain within our fold is just unbelievable. Uh, but that's the investment you're making. And what's, what's our retention rate? Is it well over 90%? Yeah, we have a good retention rate. Yeah. 
Be, uh, I mean, there are those who f go away for yeah. some certain reasons, because uh, and uh, we could always blame that on the educational system, can blame it on the parents. I can blame it on a lot of things. There's a lot of things. There's there's not one thing that will drive anybody it's away. It's a real combination. Of, it has to be the perfect storm, because yeah. normally people are lazy and don't want to leave what they're comfortable with. Yeah. So really, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, let's face it. If I'm comfortable in my life as an Orthodox Jew, I'm going to remain an Orthodox Jew. It's only when I have, or, or conservative or reform, or Christian or whatever. If I'm comfortable, I'm not going to change. It's only when I have a discomfort that I have to start thinking, okay, what's going to happen? So, and even with that, there's a lot of, my Yed Sahara is telling me, be lazy. You know, just go with the flow. Just don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. And so again, as an Orthodox Jew, I may not be as connected as I should be, but I'm not going to leave the fold. I'm going to marry a Jew. I'm going to bring the kids up Jewish. I'm going to send them to day school. I'm going to complain about the cost. I'm going to do all these things. But again, you know, it's going to, and my kids are going to do the same thing. And yeah. it's just part of it. It's just that Baruch Hashem Malaysi, <laughs> and we can keep doing it. Think of how long Hebrew schools lasted. Think about it. You st they still last. I mean, they're still there, and the parents still have the same attitude. I hated Hebrew school. Your grandfather hated it. Your great grandfather hated school, and we still do it because you need that bar mitzvah. Okay, so or oh, bat mitzvah today, whatever the case is going to be. But I'm just saying that's that's the laziness that we have. But if it's but without that, just think about uh, how much momentum we get because we have the birth rate. If not for the birth rate, we never went on philosophy. If not for birth rate, we'd be the same. The loss will come out sooner or later, but it doesn't always, if you, most people, if, if they're Orthodox Jews, don't necessarily know all the hashkafa that goes with it. And that's when they meet, uh, I'll give you an example. I, I remember I was speaking to a person who was from this whole life, and he went to a gateway seminar. Gateway seminar was originally for Balei Tshuva, really, uh, non-religious Jews. Originally it was for non-religious Jews, a key roof. For what? Gateways. For Originally, it was for, made for non-religious Jews, a way to get re non-religious Jews to become religious. Yeah. So what happened was they gave what I would consider the ABCs of Kirov. I mean, we do it every day, and but they were saying it. But what happened was some religious people went, and they were I never heard this before. Uh -huh. I never heard this before. Yeah, yeah. And here, guys like me, Rabbi Lindau, again, we're we're immersed in this, and we're looking. Really, you never heard it? What do you mean, never heard it? How can you not hear it? Is basic hashkafa, is basic Jewish philosophy. They never heard it because what they did was they went to school and they they, they learned, but you know, it was a, f a school. So you go to, you hear Gemara, you do this, you get the skills, but you don't really don't deal with the philosophies. You don't deal with the questions of how do we know that the Torah is true. Most of the Rebbeim don't go, oh, this is a proof. Hey, look at this. This is how you know the Torah is true. Nobody says that. Wow. It's only when I want to prove it to a non-religious person that I have to go through that. And so now these people heard it. So Gateways went from being wow. a Kirov organization for non-religious to religious. Boy. And so you have guys like Rabbi Ri Eddy, who was one of their, one of their uh, top speakers. Boy. I saw him speaking Friday night in Flatbush to a black hat crowd about this sort of thing. And they were all enthralled. Wow. I mean, okay, you have one guy who's always going to raise his hand because you heard the tape a thousand times. And, but what do you see about this? What is it? Okay. You, you, everybody has to have somebody in the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have to <laughs> shut him down. But uh, for the most part, everybody was like, wow, this is unbelievable. I, I never heard this stuff before. And again, you're thinking, why did you open the books? It's there. Yeah. It's all there. I have to just read it. But that's what they don't do. So again, that's part of the problem that when we don't know what our hashkafe is, we don't have a strong, uh, a, a strong grasp of it. And it's all because we didn't read the books. They're all English today. So it's, that's it. And by the way, the books would be, for those who listen to me on YouTube, Kuzuri. That's a major book. That's a major hitter. The Kuzuri, which we went through here too. Uh, Derech Hashem, which we went through here too. And then you have, uh, I wouldn't, my is more Nevuchem is not one of the uh, things you have to go through. But again, if you really have problems of how to understand God and um, 
and, and all those questions. So then he's one of the people. Oh, what we're doing right now, going from beginning to end, you saw a tremendous amount of material there. And people have to hear it. And when they do, that's when they develop a true, a true understanding and love for Yiddishkeit. And once that happens, so then that sort of Jew will never go away. Won't happen. Okay? I shouldn't say never. I mean, I guess there's always exceptions to everything. But for the most part, we'll not go away. So, but that's what we're learning. So now we start off. It says, Vayedibar Hashem and Moshe. So Hashem spoke to Moshe. The Midbar Sinai, the first boss. The Midbar Sinai in the, in the uh, wilderness of the Sinai, the Sinai wilderness. Be'ohel Mo'ed at the, <coughs> the tent of meeting. So we have to, the uh, first question you have to ask is, what? Why did it say lay more? Why does it, right? Why did it just say by Yitavira Hashem and Moshe Lemor? What do you give me all this? He spoke to him in the wilderness side, in the tempted meeting, and now we get the date. Be'ech Allah Chol Shasheni on the first of the second month. So we're not in Nisan anymore. Now we're in Iyar. So we're in Iyar like we are right now. And so it's the first of that month. So he spoke to him on Rosh Chodesh, okay? B'Shana Hashenit in this on the second year. Of when let's say Tamayotrayim from them leaving Mitzrayim to let let's say that's a, a tremendous Ooh. introduction Ooh. to this. What's going on here? Shirashi explains why does it have to say in the first of in the in, mid, in the wilderness of Sinai in the first of the month? He says Mitoch Chibatan because of God uh, because of uh, the dearness that we have before God. Mona Otam Kol Sha'ah. He counted them in every hour. Kishi okay. Yatsum Yashraim, when they left from Mitzrayim, Menan, he counted them. Kishanaflu Be'egel, and when they fell because of the Egel Azav, because of the Golden Gap, Minan, the Dahanotarim, he then counted to know how many were remaining. Kishavola Hashem Shkinatu Aleihem, and now, when he wants to, to have the divine presence of God rest upon the people, Menan, he counted them. And so why didn't he count them in the first of Nisan? Bechav Nisan, who can I mishkan? Because on the first of Nisan, they put the mishkan up. They directed the mission. So now, 30 days, 29 days later, Bechav Iyar, Menahim. So then, on the first of Iyar, he counts them. Okay, so now, how many Jews is it going to take for the divine presence to continually rest upon the Jewish people? Like, which, which one specifically do this, or which one? Say it again, please. Like, spe are these specific people, or? No, a specific number. Ten? Nope. Hundred? 600,000. Because it can never be less than 600,000. If you're going to have 600,000 Jews in one place, that's when the divine presence of God will rest upon them. Oh, that's one. Oh, I thought okay. it was that's, the that's what it says. So it's not 3,550. We don't have to have that number. But we have to have 600,000. That's going to be the, the key number, which is why when Rabbi Gudnick was talking about it from the Nefesh Chaim, he also said 600,000 instead of 603,550. That's the magic number, 600,000. Mm -hmm. That's the minimum you can have, according to the rabbis, for uh, Hashem to... Um, rest upon his divine presence to rest upon the Jewish people Ooh. okay so um, if you just look uh, we, we just read one so Ramban what we just read was Rashi's explanation he brings down Ramban which I said some of them but we'll just run through it so it says Ramban if you look at number one it says Ramban offers three reasons for that God wanted them counted again the first most miraculous growth uh, which had come to Egypt as they came to Egypt for the family of only 70. Mm. And 210 years later, because God loved them so much, he made them uh, he made them grow that much. So too did the need to count them after every significant loss, loss of life, every Jew was important to God. Yeah. Uh, okay, two questions. One, yes. um, that's two hands of Kuhua. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I thought they counted that when they counted was a half shekel, didn't they? Also. Oh, okay. So that was for the that was for the building of the temple, right? So it's what, a tabernacle. What loss of life happened? <coughs> Sorry, yeah. That loss of life happened that that would cause. No, no. Them. That when loss of life happened, like the egg was off, right. he counted them. Uh, he also counted them when he was uh, making the mishkan. Well, there was every chance he gets, he counts us because he loves us. Right. So what's his chance? Is it just because 
Well, no, no, now he's showing us, according to that one, he's showing us how much he loved him by, by growing us oh, from yeah. 70 to 603,550. So what, what do we see that in the counting of the shekels? Not necessarily, because now we're going, there oh, we're just the going. Oh, right, yeah, of the, between 20 and 60, I'm going to say. Uh, no, that was the man uh, of about 20. There oh. was no 20 and 60 at that point. Okay. I don't, I think everybody just above the age of 20, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think I don't think there was an age on it. I would have to go back to the parsha. Yeah. Uh, actually, I can do it right now. We have it right here. So kitisa, kitisa. Where is it? Uh, oops. Everyone says, when you take the census of the children of Israel according to the numbers of every man, okay, atonement, and everyone passes through. Yeah, from twenty and up. It doesn't say twenty sixty. So you'd have more of a group than you have right now. We're getting 2060, which is going to be for the uh, the army, if you for lack of better terms. The okay? workforce or the right. able-bodied force. Right. I'm not sure if the able-bodied just because they're counted, but mm. the, <laughs> but you have the 2060. Right. Definitely, definitely able-bodied is like the ability to do work. Potentially, like a, a younger child versus a really old person right. is not as well as. Correct, potentially, yes. So that would be one. Number two, he says, the second reason was, each member of the nation had a right to benefit from the personal attention of Moshe and Aaron. And the census was a great opportunity for every Jew who came before the father of the prophets and his brother, the Holy One of God, to tell them his name and to be counted as an individual of personal worth. This is also very important. Surely Moshe and Aaron would bless them and pray for them, and the half shekel contribution would bring them atonement. So think about that. How many people line up? Well, you know what? I, I, if you never, if you look at old pictures, for how many people used to line up for the Baba Chereba? Oh, around the block, they're around the block. Mm -hmm. Or to go to the Christian side of the, uh, the coin, if you look how many people line up for the Pope? Okay, yeah. they they consider him a holy man. We consider uh, people a holy men. So we line up to go to them so we can get a blessing. So now imagine if you were actually going to be able to go in front of Moshe Rabbeinu, the one who spoke face to face as it were with Hashem, had an intimate relationship. You're not going to get any higher than that. Well, I shouldn't say that. The highest you can go is by yourself. Ah. Okay. In reality, uh, talking to God is like talking to my father. So that's, but people don't really have a, really hard problem they have a really hard time with that they don't think they're going to be uh, addressed as much wow. so what they say is let me go to the tzaddik so who, what great yeah. tzaddik was there then Moshe Rabbeinu and his brother so here they were built to go and imagine what happens and by the way this happened with the Bavosh Rav the they say he had a phenomenal memory if he would meet you once he would remember you and your family when he saw your face he, he saw it wow. he would say so you could go to him and he would say, if in my case, I never went out to him, but he would say, oh, Fred, so how's your family? How's everything going? You know, he would have, and he had this problem, was it solved a year later? So, you know, they said, that's what they said about it. He had a phenomenal memory. And by the way, we all have that sort of a memory for those things we care about. Ah. And since the Rebbe was known, the Boucher was known for his Avas Yisrael, for his love of Jews, so he would remember everything. That's what they said. Again, I, I can't, I can't verify or deny the claim, but they said that about him. And as the story goes, they once had a story about the Chafetz. I think it's Chafetz Chaim, and uh, he was going to court for something, and so the lawyer started to tell the judge stories about the Chafetz Chaim, and he told him story after story after story. And the judge, the, the now the judge or the lawyer were Jewish. And so the judge looked to the lawyer and said, do you really believe all the stories? He said, Your Honor, I don't believe them. I don't believe all of them either, but they don't say that about you and me. <laughs> you know, and so the judge said, oh, innocent. <laughs> he let him off. It was, good, it was a good way to come back. In other words, if all these stories are being told about somebody and about his sitkas, about his righteousness, okay, some of them may not be true. I don't know. But do they speak about you and me about that? No, <laughs> so okay, we have to accept them. It's a beautiful thing. Okay, then he says the third thing, since the people were about to go directly into Eretz Israel, 
and would uh, would have had they not sent in the episode of the spies coming up a census was needed to prepare the military campaign and to know how many people were eligible to receive portions of the land now you could argue with me Shmuel, you can argue Shmuel and say, what are you talking about military campaign? If we're relying upon God to bring us in, so that's a miracle. We don't need a military campaign, which is why he gives you the other option also to receive portions of the land. Right? Mm -hmm. A military campaign if I need it, but regardless, I have to know how many people I have to parcel the land out to. Mm -hmm. So we have to do this count. Right? I'm going, to go, uh, I'm going in tomorrow. So I have to know what, who I have to give land to. Yeah. Doesn't the, uh, the uh, giving out land for lack of a better word, uh, doesn't that happen through a lottery eventually? It happens through a lottery, God and the high priest, yes. But in the end, that's only telling me where Reuven will settle. It doesn't tell me where you, a member of Reuven, will settle or how many right. we have oh. parcels we have to cut it up to. So we have to know how many people are there. Right. So let's take the account, let's do it now. By the way, you know what's beautiful about this? the best thing about this is it's telling you plan ahead if you want to learn something from this parsha, and it's not, nobody's saying this but it's teaching you to plan ahead hmm. know what you're doing before you go in right so you know you ask you ask kids why are you going to college I don't know <laughs> what do you want to do with your life I don't know why are you spending money I don't know because I can I mean but uh, really know what you're going to do have a game plan before you walk in. Uh, know what, how you're gonna get from point A to point B. So here God is telling them, okay, we're gonna count the people, we're gonna know how many we have. That way, if we need to have a military campaign because whatever reason, we'll know how many people we have. And by the way, we'll also know how many people, why is that important? To know who's in your battalion, to know if you lost anybody. How many times when we go on trips, it was, it was easy, I guess it was easy for you and your wife and my parents, because we only had three, you had only had two. So it's really not hard to look in the back seat and see it, one, two, uh, <laughs> or three. But what happens when you go on a school trip? Ooh. See, you guys never done school, never, right? Never on a school trip. Uh, so I'm saying from like school. Public school. Trip. Public school, right. Not that kind of trip. So again? Well, not that kind of trip. Okay. We went to NCSY, I think. NC, oh, good. When you go to NCSY, what do yeah. they do when you get in the bus? Okay, countdown. One, two, three, right? They have to count you to make sure you're on the bus. Right? I have to do that. So I have to, in order to count you when you're on the bus, I have to know how many tickets. I have to know how many people were on the bus originally. I have to have the first count. So now if I'm going to send you into war, and now, and, and I want to show you, by the way, what happens in war when you go into war? People run away. People what? Run away. No, oh, they die. I mean, they oh, get killed. I'm right, right. I thought, they get killed. Like, the worst possible point. situation, you get killed. Casualty. How do we know the casualty count? We didn't go on the battlefield and say one, two, three. Oh. We knew because they weren't coming back with us. What? They, they're gone. They're, they're, forget it. They're, they're buried. Or they're burned. We don't know. Which we don't like, know what happened. They could be run away. That's like missing, falls under the category of, cat, of casualties. Right. MIA. They're missing in action. We don't know what happened to them. But how do we know they're missing in action? Because we had a roster. <laughs> we had a roster. Who was there? We did our, we did our pre, uh, you know, what's it called? We did our uh, pre-work there. So the same way here, if I'm counting the people, now when I go to battle and nobody dies, whoa, that's a miracle. That's a, that goes beyond norm, uh, normal warfare. Somebody normally dies. Somebody's normally captured. Somebody normally runs away. Nobody does that? We, had, we started with 603,550 and we end up with 603,550? Mamash a miracle. Yeah. You need that to show how wonderful God is to us. So that's what I'm saying. If you need it for the military campaign, you have to know that. By the way, since it was a godly war, we learned this in the book of Joshua, since it's a godly war, nobody was supposed to die anyway, which is why when Joshua found it, he lost 70 people in the fight of Ai. He was like, what happened? And so the Moloch has to come and say, because you were supposed to go. You sinned. You didn't go. Well, and nobody told you to stay here back and think you're the, uh, the guns of Mashiach here. You have to go into war with everybody. You lead them in, you bring them out. Okay? And that's why the king used to always lead them in and bring them out. Unlike the non-Jewish kings who would be in the background, like we have today, the, the generals, they sit in the uh, situation room and they send their, uh, their pawns into the battlefield and they die. 
But that's a normal warfare. So that's what we normally expect. So here too, that's why the Ramban is saying, again, it could have been for battle if they would need to go into battle. The only reason they need to go into battle was because of the spies. If not for the spies, they could have walked into Israel and taken everything over. It would have been done. There would have been no fight. Everybody would have given in. Have a good day. But because they gave in, so now we have to have a miracle. Now we have to have a military victory. And then on top of that, again, I have to know how many people are I have to give land to. Regardless. Okay. So either way. Okay. And now, uh, then it says, again, on the, he continues to say, on the first day of the second month, this was the month of Iyar, although the year begins in Tishrei, the numbers of uh, months are numbered from Nisan, the month of Exodus. Thus, Nisan is the first, Tishrei is the second. And by the way, when it says Beshana Hashanit, the second year, well, let me ask you something. Was it a full year that they were in the desert at this point? Or was it, since in ours, when did they come into the desert? Uh, we, remember, we have four new years. Right. Well, let's go for just two at this point. Tishrei, which is the new year of, you know, was 5,000, was 2018. So it's 5,778 right now. Okay. Uh, so, but when does that change? That changes in Tishrei. But when does our calendar year change? That changes in Nisan. Calendar year changes in, in the calendar changes in Nisan. So now, when they said the second year, what was it? Which was it really second year? And far as Tishrei is concerned, no. The second year as far as Nisan was concerned. So it really wasn't two years. So, so why do you call it two years? Because the second year from leaving Egypt. Oh, okay. And how do you do that? Again, Nisan, they left. So once it comes to Nisan again, it's and then it's a, a year or whatever, it's a, a year, it could be a second year. So it's, it, the years, when we, that's a big thing for years in the Torah. Sometimes they're counting from one uh, point out of time for another. So you have to know which point are we talking about to, to have the real count. In other words, is it really one year? Is it really two years? Or is it really one and a half years? Is it really six months? I'll give you an example. Using English. A child is born December 31st. At 11.59 p.m. 11.59 p.m. That is he a tax deduction or not? Yes. And how much of a tax deduction is he for? Just that one day or? The entire year. The previous. He was born one minute before the year was over secular year is over, and he is considered, it, I mean, I'm assuming it's here, because I'm just a male, but he, uh, the child oh, no, is yeah. a tax deduction for an entire year. On the other hand, if the child was born <laughs> December 1st, uh, January 1st, 1201, yeah, yeah. we're talking about two minutes here, he's no longer a tax deduction. He's, for that year, he's next the next year. Okay? So, now take this, let's go further. How old is that child tax-wise? December, he was born December 31st at 1159. How old is he tax-wise? January 1st, 1201. He's a year old. You understand? Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So, again, that's what we have to know. That's it. He's two years old, according to them. Right? It's two years. He already lived a year tax wise. That's why we have to, that's what the new years are all about. So, depending on where I'm counting from, will determine whether it's really a year or not. You start the day before Nissan, once you're flipping the Nissan, so it's the second year? In ER, you mean ER. I mean, if you mean Adar to Nissan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. right. Correct. Adar to Nissan is again, same thing. Oh, so you say, yeah, the. Uh, the yeah. The second month of ER is already the second month of the second year. Second month, second year, but, but where am I counting from, right? So it was left a few weeks ago. Correct. Right? Because what happened was it goes Nissan, blah blah blah. Then it comes to Tishrei. Oh, so Tishrei now next second. Now I'm that year. 
But now, but I'm still in the first year of Nissan. Yeah. <laughs> right. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Calendar, cool. from the birth of the world, that's yeah. Tishrei. Yeah. The Jewish people, Nissan. Yeah. So now, that's why the Torah is being very careful. Yeah. I don't want to get too lost in this, but it's a fascinating <laughs> thing. That's why the Torah is being so careful. Say, let's say, tell me after this, it's identifying yeah. Nissan, not Tishrei. Yeah. Okay. All this from the first Pesach. That's why it's so long, yeah. Why, why identify it as a year? Couldn't there, which, shouldn't there be a different name for it just to avoid confusion? No, it's a calendar year. Again, it's, it's like we have in a, an American calendar. We have four New Year's. We have four New Year's in American calendar. Okay? American calendar. We have four New Year's. What is the four New Year's? You have uh, tax season, April 15th. Oh, you have yeah, yeah, yeah. the accounting new year yeah, is yeah, June, yeah, yeah. June 30th. Fiscal year. Fiscal fisc year. Yeah. The, yeah, the accounting is, well, that's, the, that's for us, 15th, the 15th. The accountants have June 30th. The, ah, they have to ah. June 30th. Then we have ah. uh, uh, January 1st, and I'm missing one. We have four, though. We have a school year. The school year, it could be the school year too. September. But, right, September. We have four New Year's, at least four New Year's in America. It's not hard because they're each marking a different thing. So when I'm, when I'm having tithes, I have to know when, to, when the tithe starts and when it ends. Again, tax season. I have to know different, and now everything is, unlike in America, we only have one tax season. So in Judaism, you have two. You have Elul and... Uh, and uh, to Shvat, you have because uh, of different crops. Mm -hmm. Then you also uh, that's two meisters you're bringing. So everything has a reason. <laughs> but but I'm, when I'm looking at this, I have to say, okay, what year? What? That's what I'm saying. Right. You have to know what we're talking about when you're saying second year. Taking year from what? And by the way, if you're looking at the flood story, that also becomes very important. What are we counting from? Uh -huh. Are we counting from Tishrei? Are we counting from Cheshvan? What mm -hmm. are we counting from? We don't know what counting. You have to know what you're counting from. Know to know. How many days you have? Yeah. So, just out of curiosity, where, what which year are we counting from for the shiva or not shiva? The uh, sabbatical year. The creation. Okay. Tishrei. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Okay. So now, with all that being said and done, like I said, it's a lot of fun to think about. So you have to <laughs> have that in mind. So it says, so, "Ooh, now, now here's also an interesting word." It doesn't say count, it says take up. So, ooh, carry, right? Oh. From Nasa to lift up. So, 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 right? Lift up. So, lift. At Rosh Koladat B'nai Yisrael, all, the head of all of the congregation of B'nai Yisrael, the Mishpichotam, according to their families, the Beit Avatam, according to their father's house, the Mishpah Shemot, with the number of names. Kol Zacharo, every male, the Google Atom, to their skull count. Head wow. count, whatever, okay. Wow. Rashi says, what are we talking about? How Again, just say count the people, leave me alone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he says, Su'u, what is Su'u? Uh, I mean, what does it mean? Da, minayan, a minion, kol sheva shevet. Know the amount of each tribe. In other words, we want to know the, each tribe's number. Le beit avotam. We also want to know the to the how, now when you're counting. How do you count? Do you count? Uh, so he says le beit avotam, which means patrilineal yeah. descent. But when it says uh, uh, mystical psalm, it's talking. It's talking about each tribe. Then correct. That's each tribe. Broad we want to know according to the tribe. What do you have? Okay. But then we want to know again. I have to count. How do I identify which tribe? Le beit avotam. Patrilineal. So it says, Misha Aviv Mishavit Echavi Imo Mishavit Achir. If you have a son, if you have the fathers from one tribe and the mothers from a different tribe, intermarriage between tribes, okay, you have that. Yeah. So, Yakum al Shavit Aviv. You establish this child by the father's tribe. That's where he's counted. No, That's where he's counted. Yeah. So, if, if, I'm, if I'm from Binyam and I get counted, but even though my mother is from Levi, or, uh, no, I forget Levi. Even though my mother's from Reuven, my father's from Binyamin, I get thrown to Binyamin's club. Why? Because that's what the Torah said so. No other reason. So, in other words, it's a patrilineal set not only for, for Kohan. Well, that's like a For everybody. So, you're, uh, yeah, your mother married over here, 
you're of the tribe of the father. Correct. So I always, so we always go patrilineal for our descent. For our Jewishness, we always follow our mother. In other words, if our mother's not Jewish, we're not Jewish, yeah. period. But uh, that's for a different reason in the Torah. But we're learning very strong, and this becomes an important thing for... Uh, we already learned it, actually. Um, the, the person who was... Did we learn it? I, I know I read it, so I forget where I read it already. Yeah. But um, the... Uh, I think we did it last... Yeah, we did it last parsha. So with his son who comes up, he, uh, he's going to be stoned, the blasphemer. The blasphemer who says, I, I'm supposed to be in this tribe, I'm supposed to be from Dan. Shlomit Badivri. Remember the girl, they identified the mother. Shlomit Badivri, she, was, she, had, she had a child with the Egyptian. Mm-hmm. And that child would come on to say, I want to have a land of allotment. So they said, well, you, you can't go buy a land. Because he said, my mother's from uh, Shlomit Badivri. What, what shape was she? Binyamin? Don. Don? I forget which one already. I forget. Uh, but I think it was done. So uh, I think you're right with done. But it, so she, he, he said, I'm from that tribe. I said, no, 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 no. It doesn't go by your mommy. It goes by your daddy. <laughs> and your daddy wasn't a Jew. Oh. Oh, now we have a problem. Okay. You don't have that. You don't get You have no problem. lineage. Oh. Okay, so you have no lineage. Oh. Leave me alone. Oh. Oh. So, and again, when it comes to land, now we're dealing with money. We're not going to be nice oh. with our money. You're taking away my money. Ooh. What are you doing? Take away my land, who, wow, who gives you the right? Wow. Okay, so that's why the Torah says, follow the Father. Mm. No reason given, just follow mm. the Father. Okay, the Google Otam, and how does it mean by the skull count? That's when we count, use the shekel, that we had to give a skull count to anyway. So we're mm. going to uh, oh. have that skull count, okay? So that's how you're doing it, according to your family. So we have to know, again, the, the tribes, according to the house of your father, following patrilineal, so on and so forth. The uh, when it says su'u, he doesn't say it here. Okay. Oh no, he does. So good. Uh, if you look at number two, it says literal. The literal translation, "lift yeah. up the head," yeah. has two possible implications: one positive and one negative. Oh. It could mean that the people would be uplifted to an exalted level, or it could mean that their heads would be removed oh. from them, yeah. as Joseph uh, used the term when he pre- predicted what, that Pharaoh's baker would be executed. Here too, the term suggested to the people that if they were worthy, they would be uplifted. If they were not, huh. they could suffer greatly. So I, Say again? If they're worthy, you'd be uplifted. If you're not, you'd be uplifted. Right. I, I, I would think that the simple explanation would be that you, I mean, you have to actually look at them. You have to see their head attached to them. You have to see them as a... You have to actually... You're kind of a one, two. You're actually looking at them. Uh, so that's you're not just saying, the father's not just handing you a list. Right. So the answer is you can't count them by one, two, three. Remember that. Yeah. So have to quit. It was it a half shekel? You have, to, you have to use. You have to skull them. Yeah. But it, that. But that's the question. You know. So. Oh, so the father, the father, then I guess would have to give some kind of proof. Here's uh, uh, I. Here's my half shekel for each of the men in my family. Yeah, they had. They, it seems that they had to bring it up themselves. Again, if I'm from 20 to 60, it's only 20 to 60. So Remember, they, oh, so they come 60. with the father, I guess. They will come with it, right? They have to come. They have to present their... their, their you have uh, to see them. Another you have, have to, to present to your lineage. He can't, he can't send a shliach to... Yeah. This right. half shekel is from... Uh, right. From Shlemy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shlemy and this one. This. No, you have to go. You have to show up. Yeah. But again, yeah. you would want to show up because you want to say, Shlomo, come to the leader. Remember, I want to see Moshe Rabbeinu. This is my one chance to see Moshe uh, Rabbeinu. Yeah, everybody I get to see him. him. So now I can go and I can say, Shalom Aleichem, I need to dub him for a shidduch. I need to dub him for this, that, nah, whatever the case is going to be. So why would I give out that opportunity? You know? And then, so it says, again, according to the families, so he brings down uh, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenevsky. And he, uh, he says, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenevsky explains, while the censuses of Exodus counted the nation as a whole, whereas those in Numbers, the book we're presently in, counted the uh, tribe separately. Until it was established that the central motif of Jewish life is the sanctuary, there was a danger that one's identification with his own tribe would lead to na- nationalism and factionalism. Once it was established, however, that all tribes look to the tabernacle as their primary unifying force, the establishment of separate tribal identities would be healthy. 
Then each tribe would realize that his individual abilities should be developed for the service of Israel's national goal of heavenly service. Then the tribes would be separate only in terms of the unique roles that they were to play in realizing the nas na national destiny. You know, they, it's always, we, we talk, when we, when we study, when we read the Torah, and we, we study history and so forth, and I'm getting in, you know, to the, uh, the, the VM uh, after uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, mm -hmm. that, that, um, the, all the talk of the Shvatim, you know, it, it's, it's, it's such, it, it's a concept that it, it, sometimes it's hard to kind of visualize because we haven't had that for a long, you know, right. For millennia, and it's just you know, what would it be like to have? Because uh, you had the twelve tribes, and then, and they were all apparently each pretty close knit units, right? And so, but the, what about tribalism and factions. What, well, because what Rav Yaakov is bringing up is imagine mm -hmm. if I don't have the central thing being the Torah, so now I'm bigger than you. That unifies everybody. Right, that's yeah, what's unifying exactly. us. Yeah. So now we become a family unit. But think about just, if, today. Think, since, Think about your extended family. Yeah. Not your immediate, but your extended. The more extended uh, you so get. that's your own little tribe. Right, that right. becomes your tribe. So you okay. want to get to know all the oranges in the world. Yeah. I would like yeah. to yeah. meet some of the nebels. If there's balances out there, more than you know, you'd like to meet them. Okay, but then we're going to start having those little wars mm -hmm. with the others because mm -hmm. uh, my family's bigger than yours, but big, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, so in other words, the bravado uh, comes out. So in order to avoid, now that only happens when we're not connected, yeah. but if we're all connected to a greater cause, yeah. namely yeah. serving Hashem. So why would I be disappointed? I'm saying this uh, so-called tribalism, uh, our tendency to it lasted so, so long because they maintained their connections as, right. as tribes and they knew who they were. Right. But he also knew that they were part yeah, of the youth. Yeah, showed up and showed up back in Texas, and and he he when they called him for a layup on a weekday, he was visiting. I think it was and and uh, he gave his name uh, 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 and and appended to the you know uh, uh, Sachar uh, 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 Poloni Ben Poloni Ruvani. Right. Ah. So what did the rabbi do? Huh? What did the rabbi do? Said it. I said it. Didn't die. Or the rabbi do whatever. I mean. Didn't die. What would you say, Ali? Actually, she. Huh? Actually, she. How would I say? Leave me alone. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, how, how much do I want to find about it? I don't it, remember. But. I think somebody asked him how he knew. I don't remember what the answer was. Well, uh, okay. <laughs> if you know, you know. But uh, like I said, what he, what, what Rabbi Yaakov is he's giving a very interesting point, though, because before we know what our mission is, then we, we tend to be uh, familial. Once we understand that we're all part of the same yeah. family, we all learn to live together. We'll have to stop here. <laughs>